As Britain's Brexit deadline looms ever closer, the chances of reaching a deal with the EU appear increasingly bleak. With no government majority, cabinet resignations and a forthcoming legal challenge over his proroguing of Parliament, Boris Johnson's leadership also looks as precarious as it is unpredictable. But away from the daily dramas rupturing the core of British life, what kind of relationships will Britain forge in a post-Brexit landscape overseas and as the UK's sixth largest export market will it be a time of boom or bust between China and the UK welcome to the point I'm Li Xin coming to you live from Beijing joining me to discuss Brexit are in the studio Professor Ding Yi Fan a senior fellow at the National Strategy Institute of Tsinghua University Francesco Sishi a senior researcher of European studies at Rimini University and from Southampton Mike Baston a senior lecturer at the University of Southampton. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on The Point. Let me go to Mr. Baston in the UK. Now, on Wednesday, the Scottish Court of uh, Session ruled that uh, the government's proroguing of Parliament was illegal. The government is appealing the declaration and the case will be heard in the Supreme Court in London next week. If the Supreme Court unfolds the ruling rendering Johnson's actions illegal, how catastrophic will it be for the government? <coughs> oh, it's incalculably catastrophic if it isn't already. Mm -hmm. If the Supreme Court ruling uh, is consistent with the Scottish courts, Johnson has already himself very publicly said he will recall Parliament. He'll have no choice. So they'll be back to the debating chamber. Uh, it will be hugely embarrassing. He, there will then be efforts put on Johnson to look at whether or not he actually misled the Queen, whether he lied to the Queen for his reasons for proroguing Parliament, which the Scottish courts have been very public and very damning about. And there will be a lot of pressure on him to resign. So it could be the end to his brief but very tumultuous mm -hmm. premiership. Wow, that's really catastrophic. But uh, before that, do you think uh, Boris Johnson will be compelled to recall Parliament um, facing the kind of circumstances that could, he could potentially be facing? And also, it's been reported that uh, Number 10 is trying to find a loophole in order to bypass the law mandating him to seek a Brexit extension. How likely is it that the government can find a way around this? I think it's, <coughs> it, there are always loopholes in, in legal rulings and, and legislation. So I think they'll be looking very, very hard. And I think he will try his best. He's made it very clear that his strategy really is Brexit or bust. Um, and he has to get the UK out by the 31st of October. Otherwise, he really has no future. He's made that very, very clear. So I think he will try. I don't think he will succeed. I think there will be so much pressure from inside his own party that they will turn against him and, and that will um, lead to his downfall. So he really has dug his own grave. Well, that's pretty uh, strong <laughs> statement. Now, the leader of the uh, Scottish National Party, Nicola Sturgeon, said we have a court saying that the prorogation of Parliament was unlawful, that is null and void. So it seems to me that the Prime Minister, the government, should immediately seize the unlawful prorogation and recall Parliament immediately. How strongly, Mr. Baston, you believe uh, her view is shared among MPs and the general public? I think it's widely, widely sh uh, shared amongst uh, members of the Parliament, particularly Scottish MPs who, who seek to benefit from this. Um, amongst the general public, I think it's interesting. If you look at the polls, the opinion polls, the Conservatives um, are either marginally ahead or quite significantly ahead. So I think a lot of the general public, and this is the reason why the, 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 leave went, the vote went le the leave way, I think a lot of the general public will actually... Um, like what they hear, the rhetoric, the strong rhetoric, that's the problem with the, the, the average British citizen. They all like him standing up to the court, standing up to institutions, as, as he sees it, standing up to the EU and, and batting for Britain. So I think the, the, the opinion will be divided amongst the general public. I think he could be uh, seen as even more popular, but amongst the, the members of Parliament, uh, very, very uh, unpopular. Well, uh, let me turn to our guests here in the studio, Professor Ding and Mr. Sishi. There is something quite peculiar for me because on the one hand, uh, what uh, Nicola Sturgeon said is very much shared by the members of Parliament, mm -hmm. uh, which are supposed to be representing the views of the general public. And on the other hand, if you go to the polls and see the opinion of the general public as reflected by the polls, they actually support a uh, tough, you know, um, prime minister. So is that 
at the root of the problem we're seeing in the UK? Mr. Professor Din. <laughs> to some extent, I think that uh, we should not forget that the, the British political institution or the British political system is a representative uh, system. That means that uh, the parliament is your prime power in Britain. So no matter you, you can try to avoid to find a way to bypass parliament or not, in the end, the parliament will have the last word, we will, we will call the shot. So to some extent, I think that uh, in, in history, in British history, a lot of kings uh, wanted to bypass the parliament, but the, the, the final result was not very encouraging. So Don't forget that the, the, the yes. British king has been the subject, put, Magna subject Carta, yes. yes, the Magna Carta, yes, that is a historic president. So, so, so the, the parliament is very, very strong. Is the final? The but parliament has always the final words. Does it mean that? Does it mean that Boris Johnson is fighting, uh, obviously, a battle that he's going to lose? But knowing that he's going to lose that battle, he still did it, or did he have some kind of hope, knowing that the general public actually support him, at least I, seen from the polls? I, I think uh, that for Boris Johnson personally, is always a p an upside. Because even if he loses, he mm -hmm. gains full control of the Conservative Party. He becomes the first truly populist leader mm -hmm. in Britain. And this is good for him. The calls, I mean, yes, I have my doubts. Also because the Parliament is always supreme. We have almost 1,000 years of history there. So kings were defeated by Parliament, opinion polls. Yes, they are important, but at the end, what people would vote, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. So Parliament is really important. Second, I think what is uh, significant is that uh, what we have is a radicalization of part of uh, British and European public against Europe. And this is a long-term uh, element that the whole world, the whole of Europe, has to pay attention to. Uh, Britain so far had... Uh, uh, avoided this loop but now is uh, right into it and we don't know what uh, the consequences for Britain and for Europe so will it's be. So finally the moment of truth whether you like it or not <laughs> <laughs> this is a question that you can't avoid. Now according to this polling company called YouGov nearly half the public or 48 percent said the the move of uh, Boris Johnson to provoke the parliament was unacceptable compared to 32 percent who thought it was acceptable so um, still uh, on this particular issue according to this particular polling, uh, polling company uh, Boris Johnson's move seemed not to be so acceptable has can we say that seen from this kind of number that the PM has uh, um, damaged his credibility at home or internationally professor Dane mm, to some extent you cannot only rely on public bullying because the public bullying is not that reliable so if you ask people's questions you do your something somehow and then you will have a favorable uh, result for, you, for you, your proposal and then the next day you, you, you ask another group of people you will have other questions uh, other responses to these questions mm. so never never believe to these kind of uh, pudding so to some extent there is two questions if the prime minister can rely on the public support to bypass or to completely topple down the parliament mm -hmm. that could be considered as a coup d'etat and then don't forget in Italian history, Mussolini, right. in, in right. German's history, uh, Hitler, all these people uh, tried to topple down the, the parliament's decisions in the name of people. In the name of people, you can do a lot of things. It's a similar you, popular yes, movement. Yes, 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 yes. So it would be tragic for, for, for British uh, political system. And then that, we, we don't know what will happen in well, the end. Yeah, another vote in House of Commons forced the government to release a series of documents codenamed Operation Yellow Hammer, and they outline several, um, quote, reasonable worst case. Uh, assumptions and as reported by the BBC these are the key points for instance protests and counter protests would take place across the UK lorries could have to wait more than two days to cross the channel some businesses will cease uh, trading and there will be a growth in the black market and some providers of adult uh, social care would fail and uh, 
um, Labour leader Jeremy Coburn has already called this uh, as a reason for not leave, whereas uh, Boris Johnson said this is some kind of a scare project. So, Mr. Baston, let me go to you again. What's your assessment of the reality of a, new, of a no deal Brexit? How damaging would it be for the UK and its larger trading partners um, on, in Europe, in the United States, and in other parts of the world? I think there's no doubt it will be damaging, just how damaging. Certainly in the short term, I think the documents just released uh, confirm people's worst fears. And there's been a lot of information circulated from industry bodies, from leading um, uh, captains of industry, leaders of large retailers uh, up and down the country who have said their supply chains will be not just fractured but almost paralyzed if we have no deal and therefore supplies will be affected, medicine, fresh fruit and veg. So I think these fees are real and, and for Boris Johnson to say there's been an exaggeration without coming up with any reason or any facts and figures and any other industry or rec respected authoritative sources is very, very irresponsible and and typical of the, the, this person. Long term, it will suffer even more because business is about long term relationships, right. partnerships, building competitive supply chains. So uh, it's very difficult to be positive on this. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the possibility of uh, some kind of extension. Now, French President Emmanuel Macron has <laughs> uh, been reported to have said or to be inclined to veto any request uh, of a Brexit extension due to so-called deteriorating situation that's according to a French diplomat. So if Boris Johnson is to bring up this extension with the EU, um, Mr. Baston, how, what are the likelihood that uh, it, be, it will be granted by the EU? Well, I think despite the, the French protestations, I think the Italians have uh, been very vocal, the Luxembourg Prime Minister recently as well, I think the EU will, will find it very difficult not to grant an extension. I think they will, mm -hmm. um, they will be seen to be part of the sort of, um, they'll fall into the blame game trap. So I think these, despite these words, I think there will be an extension granted, okay. but there'll probably be strong pressure on conditions and criteria that need to be met. Yeah. So I think there will be a short-term extension granted. Okay. Mr. Sishi, what is uh, your observation uh, on this uh, likelihood? I, I would tend to agree that the, an, an, um, an extension would be granted. However, we should follow very, very closely what is going to happen in the next uh, days and weeks because uh, uh, even an extension will be granted with a lot of conditions, uh, more conditions, and in the end, Europe will hope to have what we call the soft Brexit or some kind mm -hmm. of, of an agreement. With, uh, uh, without that, without a clear indication for that, even Europe business would be disrupted and is, they want to avoid. Mm. What is uh, Boris Johnson's position on uh, the possibility to ask for an extension with the EU? What, what do we know about that? I mean, he's adamant that uh, the UK needs to be out of uh, the, the EU by October 31st, and he <laughs> has tried to, to call uh, uh, general elections twice, but uh, it has not uh, succeeded so far. So what's the likelihood that, that uh, Boris Johnson goes to Brussels and say, please give, give us an extension? No, uh, that was not uh, the Boris Johnson's position. Boris Johnson's position is to no go to yes, to go to, to a, a he, hard he Brexit said, without, he, no, without de any mm, deal. Mm. Well, uh, it could be he a disaster. He has said he would rather yeah. be dead in a yeah, ditch. It could be a disaster for, for both. Okay, um, Mr. Baston was saying that uh, Boris he, Johnson famously said he said he would rather. His precise words. <laughs> okay, he, so his precise words recently were he'd rather be dead in the ditch. So I think he's made it very, very clear he won't go. If he really has to do that, there's no other way out. He mm -hmm. will get someone else to go on his behalf, and, okay. and he'll blame them for going. And, and still, he would, uh, fulfill, he, would keep, he would have kept his word that he's not going to Brussels, <laughs> whether or not someone else goes. Well, okay. he'll, then get, he'll then get his wish. He'll get his wish for a general election after that, which is what he wants all along. Mm. So it is in his interests to a certain extent as well. Okay. Well, let's take a very quick break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about Brexit, but more on the potential implications for trade relations with other countries, especially with China and the political relations. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We're talking about uh, Brexit, and my guests have been uh, Professor Ding Yi Fan from uh, the National Strategy Institute of Tsinghua University, Francesco Sishi, a senior researcher of the European Studies at uh, Remy University, and uh, Mike Baston, a senior lecturer at the University of Southampton. So let's take a look at the uh, potential trade relations between the UK and other countries. And of course, from the Chinese perspective, we would like to know a bit uh, about what could happen to China, for instance. Uh, uh, in the case that there is really a no deal Brexit or a hard Brexit in some people's words, what would it mean for China? Because China values very much its uh, trade and financial relationship, its financial relationship especially with the UK. Professor mm -hmm. Ding. So far I don't know because the UK is uh, one of the biggest trading partners of the European Union. So if uh, Britain leaves the European Union, uh, with other European countries we will maintain our traditional trade but with UK may, we may have uh, some problems we should renegotiate terms of trade terms of but as we used to deal with British because uh, UK is uh, one of these big trading partners of China within the EU so I think that we can mm. somehow Rapidly to find a solution. Somehow, rapidly. Not, 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 not so, so long. It's not a long way of negotiation. We can. Yeah. Somehow. At this moment, there is no trade uh, deal between uh, China and. China has been approached by some British officials to try to uh, negotiate uh, a further uh, free trade agreement mm. because as Britain will be out of the European Union, so. Britain will have more freedom to negotiate uh, so-called uh, totally yeah. zero, <laughs> maybe some, some totally free, free trade agreement with China mm -hmm. because uh, it's also in, in UK's interest to have a, a big and, and uh, somehow a very, very important uh, international trade partner as China. So to some extent, UK may be tempted to negotiate uh, a, a, free trade deal. A, f a free trade deal more than that with, with EU, for example. Mm. So, so you wouldn't say that the UK is placing a high priority with, uh, um, on uh, reaching a free trade deal with China in the first place? To some extent, it's in, in UK's interest to have so to have mm. concluded uh, a, yeah. a, some, some free trade agreement with China because uh, UK cannot rely on the United States to replace EU while China can play a more positive role for okay. EU than the United States. Um, so, uh, Mr. Sishi, what do you think? Uh, yes. So, but maybe on this, everybody, we should be waiting uh, about the results because whatever yes. agreement uh, China or Britain may want to have uh, bilaterally, this will be conditioned mm -hmm. to a great extent to the agreement e uh, EU will have with the UK. That is, if uh, the uh, Great Britain has mm -hmm. a free trade agreement with China mm -hmm. and the yes. European Union doesn't agree to, to that, this will condition also free trade agreement uh, with China. So uh, this is actually why, besides all the promises, even the United States hasn't come down to any kind of agreement, concrete agreement, with the UK. First, you have to see what are the situations of course, uh, after. Of course. But uh, um, is there a likelihood of some kind of a uh, financial crisis or even a short-term one mm -hmm. if there is a no-deal Brexit? I think, I think there is a possibility because there is a scare uh, in the city, in London market. There are millions of uh, officials uh, and uh, operators in, in London who don't know clearly what will happen with them personally. Um, and this could trigger an even bigger financial crisis worldwide. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Baston, let me get your take on this uh, question. What kind of, it, of uh, impact will the situation ha have on the financial soundness of uh, the city and its financial cooperation with uh, Europe and uh, other parts of the world? 
Well, certainly that, that's going to be an area where London will be weaker. Uh, it won't be seen as the, the, the financial centre, one of the major financial centres of the world, which it is and has been for a long time. There'll be a flight of capital. Um, a lot of UK businesses have relocated to uh, locations inside the European Union and more will do so. Uh, so that the damaging effect and that sort of domino effect, I think, will start immediately. Well, I agree with the panellists. It depends on the sort of um, outcome that we will see over the next few days and weeks and how acrimonious it is. But it, we have to remember that it really is the EU that hold all the cards here. The UK government, despite its rhetoric and, and its bluff, really, where Johnson's concerned, it doesn't really have much power. So we really are hostage to what the EU really lays down mm -hmm. and has laid down. So I think London will suffer, most definitely. But that may not be such a bad thing for the UK economy. Hmm. Do you think it is too early for the UK to start mapping out its future trade structure with countries, with economies in the world, for instance with the EU, uh, with the United States, who will be very keen, right, who has been talking about a free trade agreement with the UK, and definitely for um, the Chinese market, which is uh, the largest market in the world and, and more so in the future, and uh, who is also very keen on a uh, uh, on a strengthening trade and economic relationship with the UK? I don't think it's too early. It's never too early, no. But the evidence I have, particularly with the industries that I work most closely with, particularly the fashion and related industries, is that government, the UK government has been very, very slow to look at all possibilities, all eventualities, and to at least map out some kind of strategy or alternative strategies for different types of trade deal with the US, with China, with Canada, and very, very little progress has been made. There's been dithering, um, to say the least. So, so again, that's another area where most people are quite pessimistic business really in the UK are calling out to government for a greater lead, particularly when it comes to China, because again, my experiences with, with small companies in the UK is that's accelerated their focus on China. They're mm. looking at China even more seriously so than they have they, been. So there is real opportunity there, yeah. but governments have to get together. But is it because that the government really doesn't know where to go, if, um, you know, in, the, in <laughs> the near future, so that they can't really give any guidance or leadership on this issue? On the other hand, can the businesses just go ahead and and forge their business relationship with China regardless what happens with the with the Brexit, Mr. Baston. Well, they can and they are, and I'm working with quite a few now who are uh, successfully penetrating China, working with local suppliers, but it's fraught with difficulty, and they really do need government to take a lead and to establish some clear direction and agreements and partnerships and, and trust and friendship with, for example, in this case, the Chinese government, but that really is not happening. Why is the UK government so slow? I, I think a lot of it's just com complacency uh, and a, a certain arrogance, which really is very, very disturbing. All right. Very worrying well, for British industry. You really want to get on, but can't. Yeah. Well, um, Chinese ambassador to the UK, uh, Mr. Liu Xiaomi, actually commented on the UK politics uh, because. Um, the UK's uh, aircraft carrier, uh, HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth, is su supposed to go into service next year and uh, go on its first mission the year after next. And uh, Boris Johnson has said, and, and it has been confirmed by other uh, defense officials that the first mission of HMS Queen Elizabeth will be in the South China Sea. So that also complicates the entire situation. On the one hand, the UK wants to enhance its economic relationship with, with China. On the other hand, when it becomes global, it seems also wants to thrust itself in waters <laughs> uh, far away where it was traditionally not taking any very clear and strong stance. So what's going to be the political implication of uh, Brexit on, on geopolitics, Professor Ding? So I can fully understand uh, Boris Johnson's intention because after uh, the British leaves uh, the UK, it still wanted to show uh, its status as a global power. Uh, and then uh, you have to show your presence everywhere in this planet to show you are still a global partner, a global power. And but he then, picked the South China Sea. Yes, <laughs> yes. So the fact that uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft uh, carriers come into chi uh, South China Sea and uh, would be considered as a sort of provocation. To, Absolutely. To, to, to some extent, 
because uh, South China is so sensitive to, to external forces because within South China Sea we will try to find uh, a code of conduct among all these mm -hmm. members uh, and then we, we could reach some, some code of conduct to, to limit our, our, our behavior in these areas mm -hmm. of sea while well, external forces were coming to the South China South Sea will give a, a, a bad signal and that will show that uh, other external forces wanted to be involved into these uh, South China Sea already complicated uh, yeah. water yeah. and then that, that will make everyone very very nervous not only China but all the neighboring countries of South China is very nervous. Now it's not a secret that uh, US President Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are kind of fan to each other and uh, that uh, they have a, mm. a very style of uh, leadership or, or politics in terms of uh, being populist and uh, is it because of this, this kind of similarity or this kind of relationship between either the two leaders or the two countries see in the future that you know the UK is picking what the US wants to do as its chief mission. Mr. Sishi, how do you look at this? I think of course there is um, there is empathy between the two <laughs> leaders. They look at each other and they like each other. However, at the end of the day, uh, the United States is still very pragmatic and the president is still very pragmatic and the US will follow closely what will happen in the next days and weeks because from what we see it's not clear that we will have a no deal Brexit no. and uh, we, it's not clear what kind of outcome we will have. Possibly uh, it is possible that uh, Boris Johnson might be out of the pictures in a few days or a few weeks. <laughs> so then we have to rethink yeah. everything. Okay. Let me uh, ask the fast last question to Mr. Baston and uh, really in 20 seconds if you can. Um, is the UK likely to be used by the United States, by Washington, <laughs> to do more dirty work now if it, is, um, if it crashes out of the EU in the future? Mr. Baston. Um, unfortunately, I think that probably is the case. I think uh, <laughs> you know, with the, the aircraft carrier and the South China Sea, it probably is that historical leaning to the U.S. They will try to get a, a free trade deal with the U.S. first. Uh, and the U.S., again, m much more powerful, will play that to their own advantage. And, and the U.K. will come out of that worse off. So I think the answer to that, sadly, with this current prime minister, right. is most definitely, yes, we are the poodle of the Americans. Well, I hope that uh, can change in the future, in the, in the near future, as soon mm. as possible. Many thanks to my three guests, Professor Ding Yifan, Mr. Sishi, and uh, Mr. Baston. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can fi find me on Twitter and Facebook using the handle The Point with LA. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point. <laughs>